Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at a video from Creation Training Initiative and the king of the quote mine, Mike Riddle. I generally try to stay away from Mike here because oftentimes responding to him involves in-depth digging just to find out how exactly he has taken that particular quote out of context. But every now and then it's nice to return to Mike just as an example of how much science creationists have to ignore in order to make their points. So let's go! And we're going to start with a very interesting and critical question. How do scientists use geology to determine time? Well, there are a few different ways. Most are based in one way or another on radiometric dating, whether that be direct dating where you get an age back for the rock that you are actually looking at, or indirect dating where you date a nearby layer that can be dated radiometrically and then figure out the age of the layer that you are looking at based on its position in the stratigraphic column relative to the layer that was radiometrically dated. We can also use large impact events with known dates, not necessarily an asteroid impact, but that is one example of a large impact event. Could also be a period of extreme volcanic activity. These events can be used to date their layers and nearby layers. What do they use to determine this time over these many geologic layers that have been set down according to evolutionists over millions and billions of years? Well, to determine time, they use what's called the layers. Yes, sometimes. They use the different layers of strata to determine the many different ages of Earth history. Yes, so just as an example, looking at the diagram that you have up there, we can use Steno's laws of stratigraphy to, if nothing else, figure out the order in which those layers were deposited. So the first law of stratigraphy is original horizontality. All of the sedimentary layers were deposited close to horizontal originally, and any change in that would have happened later. Basically, gravity works. So those crooked layers at the bottom would have originally been horizontal. Now this diagram is of the Grand Canyon, so lateral continuity most definitely applies, but we can ignore that one for now. That's just the one that says that sedimentary rocks are laterally continuous over large areas. Deposition won't be localized to small spaces, in other words. Third is superposition, which can be generalized as the lower strata are older because depositional materials act as a fluid. You can't deposit a fluid on top of something that isn't there yet. Cross-cutting relations is next, where a body that cuts across a stratum must be younger than the stratum that it cuts across, as you can't cut across something that isn't there yet. The law of inclusions is similar, where rock fragments inside another rock must be older than the rock containing the fragments. So looking at the diagram, the Vishnu schist would be the oldest because it is the deepest. The Unkar group is younger than the Vishnu schist, but what about the Zoroaster granite? Well, it cuts through the schist, so it must be younger than that, but it is cut off by the same nonconformity as the schist, so it does not appear to cut through the Unkar group. Therefore, the Unkar group is newer than the granite. Now for a brief primer on unconformities, simply put, an unconformity is just time that is missing from the geologic record. Deposition is not a universal constant, so sometimes there won't be deposition, or it will be eroded away. There are three basic types, nonconformities, angular unconformities, and disconformities. A nonconformity is what separates older metamorphic or igneous rock from younger sedimentary rock, and is usually just formed after a period of uplift followed by erosion before deposition. An angular unconformity is where layers that have been deformed or tilted meet the horizontal younger rock. A disconformity is an erosional period or a period of non-deposition between parallel layers, and that one can be harder to detect than the other two. It often relies on a study of their constituent fossils in order to figure out. Back to the Unkar group, schist and granite are both metamorphic rocks, so where it meets the lower rock is a nonconformity. The Unkar group is clearly older than the Tonto group, because if it were younger it would have been an intrusion into the Tonto group, they wouldn't be separated by an angular unconformity. Also, sedimentary rock doesn't form intrusions, though there are certainly layers of igneous rock in the Unkar group. Next up is the Tonto group, which is separated by an angular unconformity with the Unkar group and a nonconformity with the granite and schist. This is sometimes referred to as the Great Unconformity, which is an unconformity that spans most of North America. The amount of time missing varies depending on the local conditions, but in the Grand Canyon where it meets the Unkar group, it's about 175 million years. But we're not worried about the specific numbers right now, just the order. So, so far we've got the Vishnu schist being the oldest, followed by the Zoroaster granite, then the Unkar group, and now the Tonto group. At this point it's fairly straightforward as there aren't any more intrusions and whatnot. It's all sedimentary depositional rocks that are horizontal to each other, so it's just a simple matter of the oldest being at the bottom and the youngest being at the top. 
So how do we know that all these guys formed over long periods of time instead of in, say, one single year-long flood? Let's ignore everything below the Great Unconformity for now. We can figure out a rough timeline based on the environments that we see represented. The Tonto group shows the progression of a great sea. As rivers flow into it, they deposit sand near the coast, which eventually forms a conglomerate sandstone. As the water from the river flows into the sea, the lighter sediment, the silt and clay particles, settle farther out into the sea, which eventually harden into shale. Farther out into the sea, normal marine life is going about its business, part of which results in the precipitation of organic lime muds, forming limestone. In the Tonto group, we can watch as the sea expands over the continent, with the Tapit sandstone that originated as the beaches being covered by the bright angel shale of the deeper sea, and eventually being covered by the Muav limestone. Then there is a disconformity, followed by the Redwall limestone formation, which has four distinct members based on their differences in lithology, or the characteristics of the rocks that make them up. I'm not going into the details of each member, but there are several different depositional environments that can be seen in the formation. Lithologic evidence shows that during the deposition of the Redwall Limestone, there was a sea that covered the Grand Canyon region and then receded three times, which left different depositions each time. Next up is the Supai group, which is mostly a mixture of sandstone and limestone. Looking at this group across the continent, we see the basin areas starting to fill with water, but on the continent the environment seems to have been dry and sandy, with aeolian deposited sandstone becoming more frequent. Above the Supai group is the Hermit Shale, which despite its name is not entirely shale. There are fossilized footprints, mud cracks, and raindrops in this formation, which shows that it was exposed to the air. The plant and animal fossils that we see in this formation paint a picture of a semi-arid environment with occasionally flooding rivers. Next is the Coconino Sandstone Formation, which is a creationist favorite because this formation has many characteristics of being wind deposition in desert and forest environments. Creationists will often claim that the cross-bedding angle in the Coconino Formation is only 25 degrees, not the 30 to 34 degrees that one would expect of deserts. Except one would not expect an average crossbed angle of 30 to 34 degrees in deserts. That's the maximum for dry sand, not the average. The 25 to 28 degree average crossbed angle for the Coconino Formation is quite acceptable for the possible range of 11 to 34 degrees. But this fact alone does not necessarily point to a dry environment. Marine dunes can have a similar angle after all. But we also have reptile footprints, raindrop indentations, millipede footprints, wind ripples that are superficially similar to wave ripples but are actually quite unable to form underwater, and more. So we have a sandstone formation that was laid down in a dry environment. And then the Coconino Sandstone, Toroweep Formation, and Kaibab Formation together form a situation similar but not identical to the Tonto Group, where the sandstone was sand close to the edge of the continent, the Toroweep was the material that was deposited in the shallow water at the coast, and the Kaibab formation was the deposition that was happening in the deeper marine environment, with the formations ending up on top of each other as the sea encroached on the continent again. So now that we've looked at the different depositional environments that would have been needed to form the different formations in the Grand Canyon, we can get a picture of approximately how long it would have taken for these depositional environments to do their thing. We have a slowly progressing sea, which has to be moving slowly enough that large sandy beaches have time to form before ending up in the deep enough water that they would have had the lighter silt that is carried further into the sea end up on top of them. The light silt then has gentle enough waters and enough time to settle before the sea deepens to a point where organic lime mud can be deposited on top of it. Then there is evidence of some missing time before a faster moving, geologically speaking, sea covered the continent and then receded three times, leaving us with the Redwall limestone, much of which is organic limestone, which requires relatively calm and steady conditions to form. Then there is some more missing time, and then the next environment we see is a landscape where the lowland basins were filling with water, but the high grounds are sandy and relatively arid in the Supai group. And then the basins dry up, and we're left with a vast desert with some forested area in the Coconino Sandstone, which then shows more evidence of an encroaching sea in the same manner as the Tonto group, but much slower this time. I have vastly oversimplified it, and we have at least eight distinct environments with some chunks of time missing in between them. Just from this information, alone without doing any radiometric dating, it is obvious that these formations would have taken hundreds of thousands of years to form, at a minimum, if I'm being generous. If you want a bit more detail on some of the depositional environments that we find all throughout the stratigraphic column, the majority of which would not be possible in a worldwide flood, check out my Evidence for Evolution video on geology. It's called Layered Strata. 
Okay, sure. You can summarize all the stuff that I just said in two words. Layered strata. Fine. But I want to show you there's a big problem with this kind of thinking. I call it a time bomb. Is the problem that I went into more depth than you wanted? You just want it to be layers laid down by water. You don't want to look specifically at which environments can be seen in the layers, just most layers are water, so it must all be water, so it must be the flood, right? That's going to blow up this whole entire concept of millions of years of geologic time. In 2012, there was a newsletter that came out on stratigraphy. Now, what does strata mean? Layering, a way of recording different layers. Well, no, stratigraphy is the study of strata, not just the record of it. It may seem like a minor distinction, but I feel like this is just part of you painting a bigger picture that you want to try and deconstruct. If it's a record of the strata, that just means that they're recording that there are strata. The interpretation of that record is completely up to us. But no, it's a study of the strata, and stratigraphy is consistently one of the biggest rabbit holes that I tend to get stuck in, because there is so much data and it is so easily available. There was a newsletter in 2012, and this newsletter came from three different major people in the field of geology. No, the newsletter itself is a journal. Those three people just happen to be three people who published a paper in the newsletter. Now he's going to give you their titles to make them sound impressive, and they are impressive. But let me simplify it. They wrote the book on the geologic timescale. And I mean that literally. They co-authored GTS 2012, GTS standing for Geologic Timescale. GTS 2012 is a reference book which compiled all of the most up-to-date geologic and stratigraphic data at the time into one place, which can be referred to when deciphering the different strata. It is 1,176 pages all about the different strata, how they have been dated, how we know these dates are accurate, what margins for errors are on these dates, and more. But yeah, you're going to give an out-of-context quote from a paper they published in the same year as the guidebook to dating strata in an attempt to show that they don't believe that strata can be dated. What did they say? In that newsletter, they made this statement. The new data has revealed that many of the current divisions are either misplaced in terms of global geodynamic events, in practical terms of global correlation, or meaningless in terms of significant lithostratigraphic, biological, and biochemical changes across much of the globe. Yep. That was in their section on the Precambrian, which is a period of time that includes the Cryogenian and the Ediacaran. If you read the description of the book they wrote, the GTS 2012, it was supposed to be an improved and expanded version of the GTS 2004. One of the expansions they made was a chapter on the cryogenian Ediacaran period slash system. So that quote that you're reading is part of their explanation as to why it was necessary for them to add that section into the book. The new data has revealed that the old data was not specific enough, so a new chapter was needed to correct that. We learned more, so we updated our model to reflect the new information. The paper you are quoting is literally them summarizing the problems with the GTS 2004 that made them feel the need to publish the updated GTS 2012 in order to fix these problems. And then they continue on with this statement. Continual improvements in data coverage, methodology, and standardization of chronostratigraphic units imply that no geologic timescale can be final. You say they continued on as if that was supposed to be the next sentence, or at least one that's really close to it, but they're separated by 13 pages. This quote is from the conclusion, where they have laid out which problems with the GTS 2004 they are setting out to fix, and they begin their conclusion by pointing out the fact that they are aware that new discoveries might bring errors with their timescale to light requiring another update. It's called humility. This is the best answer we have so far, but we are open to the possibility of future better answers. Now, there's another one of those big words, chronostratigraphic. What does chrono mean? Time. In other words, what they're saying is there's no exact way to measure time using these layers. No, you're focused on the wrong thing there. Chronostratigraphic units are just units of time as measured by the strata. They are not saying that it is impossible to measure time using strata. They are saying that future improvements in our ability to accurately measure time using strata will cause the geologic timescale to need to be updated again in the future. And this is expected to keep happening for as long as we continue to make improvements. This is only a problem if you think your work is already perfect. You also strung those two quotes together as if the second one is directly referring to the first one, but that is just not the case. 
Mr. R. R. Lemon, PhD, in his book, Principles of Stratigraphy. <sighs> Damn it. I got excited there for a second. I thought I already had that book. But it turns out the book that I already have is Principles of Sedimentology and Stratigraphy by Sam Boggs Jr. Oh, well, eventually the creationists are bound to quote a book that I already have if I wait long enough. Makes this statement. It, stratigraphy, provides the means of piecing together a calendar so that world geologic records can be brought together in a coherent whole. Modern stratigraphy would be impossible without biostratigraphic fossil control. Well, this is a bit of a tricky one to parse out for a few reasons, not the least of which is that I can't find a digital copy of the book in order to check context, and the closest library that seems to have a physical copy is in Australia. If I were to guess, I would say that when he says that modern stratigraphy is impossible without biostratigraphic control, he is referring to the fact that biostratigraphy is such an important part of stratigraphy in general at this point. Stratigraphy being the study of the layers, and biostratigraphy being the correlation and age determination of rocks based on their constituent fossils. The correlation with fossils allows us to build a picture of the environment of the entire world at the same time by studying the strata in different locations in the world and using biostratigraphy to make sure they are from the same time period. What is he saying there? The only way to determine the time of these layers is not the rock layers. It's the life forms, the fossils we find in there. Eh, that doesn't look like what he's saying to me, not even close. You can look at all the strata in one spot and get ages for the layers through multiple methods, radiometric methods, relative dating methods, and yes, even using index fossils of known ages. What he seems to be saying here is that these index fossils can now be used to correlate the layers globally, giving us a much wider picture of past environments of the Earth. That's what biostratigraphic means. Bio means life. Yes, biostratigraphic does mean roughly the study of fossils in the strata. But just because you can roughly define a word doesn't make the rest of the guy's statement mean something other than what he was actually saying. So here he's clearly saying it is not the layers, it is the fossils that determine the age of the layers. So now, let's take on this challenge, geology and time. How good are the fossils at telling time? How accurate is this method of using the fossils to determine the age of the geologic layers. It depends entirely on which fossils you're using. Some index fossils have a wider chronological range than others, meaning that organism was around longer. And so dating a layer that the longer lasting fossil was in will be less precise than a layer that the shorter duration fossil will be. But keep in mind that all of this relies on the absolute dating of certain layers. So if we go back to the Grand Canyon, the Vishnu basement rocks and some of the layers of the Unkar group can be dated using radiometric methods. And this is where index fossils come in handy. To the best of my knowledge, all of the rock above the Great Unconformity is sedimentary, meaning that absolute dating will have higher error bars. You can absolutely date sedimentary rock, but it doesn't give you the age of the rock itself. It gives you the age of its constituent grains. So you can date the grains, and sedimentary rock cannot be older than its youngest grain, so the youngest grain you find can be used to put a rough age on it. But remember in the Tonto group how we are literally watching a sea encroach onto land as you get into the higher layers? Well, if you trace those layers laterally instead of vertically, you will eventually find different environments in the same temporal layers. By doing this, you can find rock layers that can be absolutely dated that are in the same temporal strata as the other rock that cannot be absolutely dated. Sometimes index fossils can act as a shortcut for cross-referencing different environments and thereby applying pretty accurate dates to layers that otherwise could not be directly dated. Well, let's go to the U.S. Geologic Survey. And they make this statement. Key to the relative time scale are examples of index fossils, the forms of life which existed during limited periods of geologic time and thus are used as guides to the age of the rocks in which they are preserved. Yes. Index fossils are fossils that are known to exist in limited time periods. So when you find a rock with an index fossil in it, you now have a good idea of the age of that rock. An index fossil doesn't become an index fossil until it is extensively studied and researched and found to really be temporally limited and thus will be a good index fossil. 
Now, technically, any fossil could be an index fossil, but one of the keys that makes something a good index fossil is how easy it is to identify. And this includes identifying that particular variant of the fossil from other members of the same group that existed in different time periods. So if you find a trilobite, but you don't know what kind of trilobite it is, you know that the rock it was found in is anywhere from 521 to 251 million years old. But if you are able to identify it as a cyclopede trilobite, you have now narrowed that range to 485 to 443 million years old. So by properly identifying it, you have brought the uncertainty down from 270 million years to 42 million years. Did you get what they just said? This is the U.S. Geologic Survey stating this. The rock layers aren't the method we use. It's the life forms or index fossils, fossils that lived during a short period of time then died off, that's what's used to determine the age of these different layers. That is one method of many, and it is only used after the age of the particular fossils that are used are well known and well documented. Well, I want to show you there's some problems here. We're going to do a little what's called critical thinking here. Forgive me for saying so, but I doubt that very much. So let's look at number one, invalid reasoning. Dating rock. How did they determine the age of a rock layer. In many ways, including absolute dating, relative dating, and with index fossils. Even if we removed absolute dating and index fossils, we can see processes that require long periods of time in the environments that are recorded in the rock layers. What they just told us is not the layers, it's the index fossils that are found in the layers. That is one method, yes. So they use the index fossils to determine how old the layers are. But wait a minute. How old do we know the fossils are? How do they know how old these fossils are? By dating the rock layers using other methods. Once a fossil is known to be restricted to a specific time period, it can then be used as a shortcut for dating the layers that it is found in. How do you know the age of the fossils? By the layers they are found in. Did you get what just happened there? Yeah, if you don't think about it too much, it does look a bit like circular reasoning. But this kind of thing is used in more than just geology and paleontology. If you find a site with human remains and you're unsure of what date it might be, you might use a coin that is found at the same site to apply a date to the rest of the find. It's the same idea here. Coins with, say, Caesar Augustus depicted on them have a known temporal range, so when you find a coin with his head on it, you know within that range how old the coin is. And of course, in archaeology, just as in paleontology and geology, there is more to it than that, and just looking at this one fact in isolation can look fallacious, but that doesn't mean that it is used in a fallacious way, just that people who don't study it carefully might misunderstand. Let's look at number two, the problem, living fossils. These fossils are supposed to have lived for a short period of time and then died out, so they're called index fossils. Index fossils are species that are known to have lived for a short period of time. As index fossils are not the only method of dating rock layers, we can and do regularly check to make sure they aren't being found out of place. And if we find one that is outside the range that it's supposed to be found in, it would trigger a bunch of re-examination of any data that was put together using that particular fossil as an index. But that is a rare occurrence. Well, let's take a look at some of these so-called index fossils. Let's start with the coelacanth. Fish. To the best of my knowledge, the coelacanth has never been used as an index fossil. I'm skipping his story about it, but if you're not familiar, it was thought that the coelacanth went extinct about 66 million years ago, but a variety of coelacanth was found living off the coast of South Africa in 1938. The creationist claim here is that they haven't changed in 80 million years, which isn't true. There are important distinctions between the fossil coelacanths and living coelacanths, but it wouldn't matter if it were true. Remember the Cyclopes trilobite? You find one of them, you have a date range of 42 million years. If the coelacanth has truly remained identical for 80 million years, that just means that if a future civilization were to decide to use them as an index fossil, they would have a date range of 80 million years. Geologically speaking, that's not really all that long. He also brings up a couple other species that have apparently not changed much over long periods of time, which isn't a problem. Evolution does not demand that things change if they are successful as they are, and we don't use organisms that span long periods of time as index fossils, so they really have no place in this section of the video. Also, he keeps saying these things have not changed, even though they have, just not much. Let's go to number three, called out-of-place fossils. Now, what is an out-of-place fossil? A rock layer is designated for a specific time period, often contains fossils 
from different time periods. And I'm looking forward to seeing your source for this claim. I could see it being a case of a layer dated using relative dating methods later being found to contain a fossil that shows the relative dating to have been in error, which would usually just happen when there's a hard to detect disconformity. But let's just wait and see. There's the problem. See, out of place fossils. Again, index fossils are supposed to be for a specific time. But what we're finding is, in each one of these layers, we're finding fossils all up and down the geologic column. Well, yeah, of course we're finding fossils all up and down the column. But to the best of my knowledge, we've never actually found a truly out of place fossil. We're finding the same fossil in many different layers. They're out of place. The same fossil having a wide temporal distribution might make that particular fossil bad at being an index fossil, but that doesn't do anything to show that the fossils that we do use as index fossils are out of place. That's what an out of place fossil is. We find flowering plants that are out of place, birds out of place in many different geologic layers, dinosaurs in many different geologic layers, mammals and bees in many different geologic layers. So, do you have an example of angiosperms in rock layers that are older than the Cretaceous? Non-avian dinosaurs outside of the Cretaceous, Jurassic, and Triassic? Avian dinosaurs before the Jurassic? Mammals before the Triassic? Bees before the Cretaceous? Also, these are all broad categories of organisms. If you find a fossil of an angiosperm plant in the Cretaceous, that by itself is not a problem. If you find a fossil of the Fregaria ananasa in the Cretaceous, though, that would be massively out of place, as domestic strawberries have their beginnings in the 1800s. And yet, domestic strawberries are angiosperms. Out of place fossils show index fossils are not real indicators of age. Michael Lord. MS in atmospheric science and also a researcher in earth science makes this statement. You may be surprised to learn that fossils are being found in the wrong place all the time. Yes, because when discussing the discovery of out of place fossils, we naturally want to turn to a meteorologist who is on the board of directors at the Creation Research Society. If that is a true statement, then it should be very easy to find a paleontologist making a similar statement. So why would you go with the weatherman? Now, here's a new one. Fossil squid recently found. According to evolution, this was a 150 million year old fossil squid. And what did they find out about it? The squid was discovered to contain a fresh ink sac. In other words, fresh ink was still in this squid, and it's 150 million years old. Folks, something is wrong with the evolutionist timescale. It was not fresh ink, not even close. It was fossilized ink. They didn't crack open a rock, find a reservoir of usable ink, dip their pens in, and start drawing. In order to turn what they found into something that could be used as ink, they first had to grind it down into a powder, and then combine it with an ammonia solution. That's not something you have to do in order to use fresh ink. I think I'll leave it there for today. I kind of took up a whole lot of time with that geology lesson at the beginning. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Vegan Viking, who says, Atheists are borrowing their morals from the Bible. Yeah, that's why probably most atheists are for same-sex marriage, because we're borrowing from the book that says homosexuals are abominations. I always hated that argument. Yep. The fact that different people have different ideas about what constitutes morality kind of demonstrates that no, we don't all have one single source of ultimate morality. This is one of those instances where if you agree with a part of their moral code, like saying that murder is wrong, they will tell you that this is you getting your morals from God. But as soon as you hold a moral position that they disagree with, of course fallen humans have corrupted the morality that is written on our hearts by God. It's a damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of situation. Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, especially Mark McManus, who are the fossils that are indexed to determine my channel's age. If you'd like to date me, you can support the channel for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. Other ways to support the channel, such as direct donation or my Amazon wishlist, are linked in the description, as well as my social media accounts and my P.O. Box address. See you next time! Mm -hmm.